Now, to move not beyond meat, but move on with the debate, I call upon Kara Adams to conclude the side proposition. <laughs> I've read the motion, and I believe we should move beyond all meat. So what we choose to eat has consequences far beyond the circumference of our plates. Specifically, your vote tonight expresses your allegiance to or rejection of a white supremacist patriarchal worldview. Do we vote to further inequality and sustain world-destroying violence? In the sexual politics of meat, I introduced the concept of animals as absent reference. In order to be eaten, animals must disappear as living beings, that is, be killed. They then disappear conceptually, as so many forms in which we eat animals' corpses are massaged by euphemistic language, hamburger, steak, pork, bacon, etc. Even the speaker just before me talked about turkeys, He's talking about dead butchered turkeys of whom part of their bodies will be eaten. Meat eaters order leg of lamb, not a baby lamb's leg. The animals cannot possess their own body parts. Tonight, think about how the language of our debate has or has not participated in the structure of the absent referent. Who disappears and why? 21st century animal eating requires our complicity in a new colonialism. We know how settler colonialism worked, an erase and replace system that forced indigenous people off the land, replacing them with cattle and white settlers. I recognize today as Indigenous Peoples Day. One of the defining aspects of the colonial legacy is an ongoing white supremacist belief system and an ownership paradigm. When you own the land, you get the title to it. Entitlement and ownership are linked. All the justifications for the taking of land by white colonial authorities included the claim, well, the Indians can't prove they own the land. Hunting exists within this colonial ownership paradigm. It presumes that animals don't have title to their own lives. Once dispossessed of their lives, the hunted animal can become your property. On that point. Uh, in a minute. Approximately 90% of Native Americans were killed off by erase and replace settler colonialism. It's the new colonialism that boasts, I'll hunt for myself and be grateful like the Native Americans. As well, like the Native Americans, I thank the animal for their sacrifice. And I wonder, how do you know the animal would have picked you to feed off their corpse? The argument that hunting is ethical presumes that some primeval form of eating exists, <laughs> unmediated by corrupting influences of society. There's no room in the new colonialism for an indigenous worldview to exist. Instead, it collapses more than 100 Native American nations into one amalgam and attributes a static indigenous worldview that erases those nations that were predominantly vegetarian and lived in urban areas. Question. The new colonialists see nothing wrong with a pick-and-choose approach to indigenous thought that never engages with the survival issues indigenous peoples are facing today. 70% of the population would have to be eliminated for people to try to rely on hunting to survive. Who would live and who dies and who decides? As for domesticated animals, Percy Shelley pointed out just after being expelled from Oxford, the quantity of nutritious vegetable matter consumed in fattening the carcass of an ox would afford 10 times the sustenance if gathered immediately from the bosom of the earth. 200 years after Shelley, as we've heard, one third of the land mass of the world is committed to animal agriculture. Entire ecosystems are disappearing. 80% of deforested acres in the Amazon were cleared for animal-based cattle grazing. And yet tonight at dinner, I saw the lion's eaters send meat back from their plates. So-called free-range animals contribute more greenhouse gases, while killing them in mobile slaughterhouses requires more water than industrial slaughterhouses and leaves behind an immense amount of waste requiring an intense amount of chemicals in the process. 
Your meat may be organic, but your slaughtering isn't. If you eat animals, you take up more climate space, requiring more water, more land, more forest deforestation, contributing more greenhouse gases. This is felt disproportionately by countries in the global south. Their carbon footprint is smaller, but they experience more frequent and intense climate change caused weather events. These events especially affect girls and young women. Your hamburger comes with a dose of misogyny. The Western world colonized their space without sending a single beef eater. Through colonial power, the diet of beef-loving English people became normative. The food heritage of pre-conquest peoples, like the land itself, was overrun. It was the colonizers, especially the British, who declared that the virility of meat-eating nations explained their success over the supposed feminine and weak rice-eating countries they, they defeated. Historically, the vast majority of the world lived without animal protein as a central part of their diet. The assumption that the best protein comes from corpses is a racist belief, as it erases and replaces indigenous African, Asian, Mesoamerican cultural food practices. Meat eating is also one of the ways gender-based structures of oppression are perpetuated. Men in the West are taunted to renew their man card by eating meat because that's what real men do. That's the sexual politics of meat, and it reveals how unsettled masculinity really is. Back home, my library card is good for seven years, but a man card can expire between breakfast and lunch if someone eats a veggie burger. Masculinity, a construct of the gender binary facing constant destabilization, feels always under threat, and eating animals is its protection racket. Question? That's why after 9-11, <laughs> nope. That's why after 9-11, a focus on men as heroes and on meat eating became part of the reclamation of a wounded masculinity. When a black man was elected as US president, we saw how white this wounded masculinity was. White supremacists weapon, weaponized it, eating meat, eggs, and dairy. Images of milk-drinking white men, of platters groaning with meat, and the baiting of liberal men as so-called soy boys are all part of the neo-Nazi <laughs> messaging. <laughs> this is their right, the neo-Nazis say. This is their identity. The new colonization rests on the unstable foundation of white men's insecurities. Look at the way people, uh, men, in the animal industry speak of female animals as willing and ready to be made forcibly pre pregnant, which female animals are powerless to resist. There'd be no meat eating without the constant forced reproduction by female animals. Yet popular culture is flooded with references to sexy cows, sexy pigs, sexy chickens, sexy fishes, who all just want to have fun. They want to be pregnant and they want to be killed because this feminized sexuality wants to be eaten. The only desire animals are credited with possessing is the desire to be consumed which strangely can only be expressed after their death. Real life tells a different story. Animals try to escape from slaughterhouses or farms. When able, cows try to reclaim their calves, taken from them so their nursing material can be monetized and sold to humans. They fight and resist the fate the colonial empire claims is their welcomed destiny. Some meat eaters are afraid of what they will feel if they look too closely at the degradations that constitute animals' experience. Mention disabling practices or the devastating separation of cows and their babies, and we hear meat eaters exclaim, don't tell me. Why are they afraid of the feelings such knowledge produces? They accept a patriarchal construct that views feelings as unruly and untrustworthy, causing chaos. To say you care about animals is considered a sign of weakness in a world still committed to the gender binary 
that values stereotyped masculine reason over stereotyped feminine feeling and wants order. And yet the reasons we hear are so irrational. If I did not eat animals, they never would be born. Meat eaters like anti-abortionists have forgotten that one quality of non-existence is not having awareness about existence. Meat eaters say, why, if we put prisoners to work in slaughterhouses in England, they will be learning a skill. I did not know that killing was a skill generalizable to other jobs. The new colonialist boasts, I only eat meat from locally owned farms, and I know the farmers there love their animals. If killing what one loves is standard practice, I hope they don't start loving me. <laughs> what about carrots? What about carrots, we're asked, though I've never seen a meat eater leap into the road to save a carrot from being run over by an automobile. When all else fails, meat eaters assert that animals are not our equals. One would think such an equality would require us to respond more, not less sympathetically. Meat eaters tell me it's so hard to change, and yet I watch them work even harder not to change. If you all agree that 95% of meat is from factory farmed animals and it's wrong, stop eating it. Go to your colleges and eat the vegan option, which every college at this campus offers. It's very simple. If you agree with the basic things so that we're not even debating factory farms, then act on it. So is our global outcome to be determined by people afraid to change who are going to hold on to some old conceived notion of power? Change may be hard, but not changing is harder. Tonight you're being asked to vote on whether you accept this new colonialism or not. Our menu choices don't stay on the plate. And I heard all your laughter. I know some of these must be new ideas, or you think they're fringe or whatever. Our whiteness is part of the problem of meat eating. It really is. So your vote tonight is important, but even more important is the question of what or who will be on your plate in the morning. Sweet dreams.